peace be yours in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our text this morning is Revelation chapter 21. The second to last chapter of the Bible. The whole Bible. The second to last chapter. Revelation 21, the next chapter 22. Book is ended. And Revelation answers this question. Where are we headed? That's something we all would like to know, right? Where are we headed? And sometimes we'll think, well, in the short term, uh, we're headed into June 2022. It's also summer. Maybe we're headed on vacation. But where are we really headed? Where are we headed long term? Do you know where it is? Heaven. We have to remember that. Where are we headed? Heaven. The Lord's kingdom is eternal kingdom, his gift of grace and forgiveness. We have to remember that because lots of things muddy that image for us. We are headed toward heaven. Now we might say we're headed toward heaven. The question becomes, well, how do you get there? It's very important how we answer that, right? How do we get there? Yeah, believe in Jesus. I'm hearing from the congregation. That's exactly right. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go there, I'll come back and take you to be with me. Wherever I am, there you'll be, right? Then he says this mysterious thing. You guys know the way to where I'm going. And what do they say? Lord, we don't know the way. <laughs> What's he say? He's the way, right? There isn't another way. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by him. A couple weeks ago, the, the, I always love it when the scripture has an image that runs throughout the, the books of the Bible. The consistency is, is amazing. It shows the one authorship of the Holy Spirit, of course. But uh, Revelation chapter 9, that was a couple weeks ago we were reading in Revelation 9. And an angel says to John, they're looking at the millions of people, remember from every tribe, language, people all the people around the world that are in heaven. And the angel says to John, who are these people and where did they come from? And John says, sir, I don't know, you do. And this is what he says. These are they who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Right? Who are they? How did they get there? By their own works and righteousness? No. How did they get there? They've washed their robes in the blood of the lamb. Now, that's a book written by John. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew records a parable from Jesus where Jesus says a king was having a, a, a wedding celebration for his son and he invited all the top people of town. And they're too busy to come. Right? They're busy. They can't be bothered by this piddly request from the king. And so the king says, well, go out to the street corners and bring in here anybody you can find. I love that text. That's us, by the way, right? We are the anybody. Bring them in. And they do. They bring them in. I would go to the king's wedding, right? Don't you think that sounds nice, the king's son's wedding? But there's this challenging part. It says that the king sees a man who's not wearing wedding clothes. And wants to catch us. The same thing Revelation 9, these are they who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, a man not wearing wedding clothes. Now, they brought in the poor. Can the poor afford to dress like they would at a king's banquet? No. So how does he get wedding clothes? It must have been given to him. You see the same thing? How do you get to heaven? It's given to you as a gift of God's free grace. This man not wearing wedding clothes, what he's saying is, I feel comfortable standing here in my own righteousness, and that man is kicked out. No, Revelation 21, again, toward the end of the book, I want us to hear just the first verse that was read a few moments ago. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, in other words, plagues that have already been poured out, that most of human history is, is written now, and he says this, come, I will show you the what? The bride. This is one of my favorite images of scripture. This answers the question, we already said, where are we headed? Heaven. How do you get there? By grace. But this is the question here. How does God see you? 
Come and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. I think it's one of the most beautiful images of Scripture. Consistent again, Revelation 21. I'm going to show you the bride, Revelation 19.7. says, the wedding of the Lamb has come. I just want to say this. I love weddings. Weddings are nice, aren't they? They're celebratory. There's lots of food. It's wonderful. At one time, we're all young and beautiful. That's a good thing. Here's the thing. When you have a wedding, has everyone come to see the pastor? Not so much, right? Has everybody come to see the DJ? Some of these guys are not aware that the answer to that is no. <clears throat> have they come to see the groom? Actually, no. And I love the part of the wedding where the pastor is standing at the front of the church and then the groom and then a bunch of groomsmen. Nobody's even paying attention to us. <laughs> I usually whisper something at the guy and he's like, people are watching. I said, not really. <laughs> They're looking for the bride. And the bridesmaids come in. And that's wonderful, but they're looking for the bride. And I always love it that we hide the bride away. We're not supposed to see her until at the last moment the door opens and everybody turns to look. And what do they do? They gasp. There she is, the bride. She's beautiful. Hold that image. That is how God sees you. I want us to get that. That is how God sees you. The beautiful bride, decked out, waiting for this moment. And the reason I pause and I want to make sure we get this is that that is how God sees us no matter what the world says. I want us to catch that. No matter what the world says. Because the world likes to drag you down, doesn't it? The world is so negative and critical. The tone of our era, it's just tough. You say one wrong sentence, canceled. That's wrong. We're all sinners in need of redemption and saving. But having been redeemed and saved, Christ says, there's my bride. That's you. That's Revelation 21.9. Come, I'll show you the bride. And then he switches metaphors. Revelation 21.10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high. And he showed me what? The Holy City. This is another way to talk about how God sees his people. He sees you as his bride. He sees you as the Holy City, Jerusalem. I love the details. It says that there are 12 gates and the names of the 12 tribes of Israel are on those gates. There are 12 foundations and the names of the 12 apostles are on those foundations. You know what that's saying? Uh, that is saying all of the Old Testament saints, all of the New Testament saints, one church, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all those folks, Rebecca, all that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, us. Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, one church gathered into one city, the holy city, Jerusalem. That's a wonderful image as well. I want to say a couple of things. One thing is Jerusalem is a real city, right? There is a place. I looked it up this week. It's 31 degrees north, 35 degrees east. That's where it is. It's a real city with traffic and taxes and all the rest. Did you know the Bible always talks about going up to Jerusalem? Has everybody noticed that? You always go up to Jerusalem. It's a very simple truth. Do you know why you go up to Jerusalem? It's on a hill. It is literally the case that every direction from wherever you're coming from, you go up. But I want us to get this. It's not just where is it. It's not just it's on a hill. I want us to get in the Jewish mind what Jerusalem was. It's so central, so central, Jerusalem. The temple is there. The word of God is there. The Ark of the Covenant, at least at one time, was there. The original stone tablets were in the ark. The priesthood, the sacrifices, the atonement for the sins of the people. The king is there, the throne is there, and a son of David reigns, Jerusalem. Did you know 
It was the goal of every Jewish person at least once in your lifetime to get to Jerusalem. No matter where you lived, get to Jerusalem one time. In fact, they would say, every, if you celebrate Passover and you're not in Jerusalem, you know what you're supposed to say? Next year in Jerusalem. Right? I love that phrase, next year in Jerusalem. Now, if I say the phrase holy city, what do you think of? I've discovered this now that I've moved to South Carolina. When we say the holy city, we mean Charleston. It's a great town. I love it. Renee and I love the city of Charleston. I'm not sure about the holy city, but I get it. If you say in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, the holy city, what do you mean? St. Louis. Very nice. In fact, I try to train people. Every time I say St. Louis, you should say holy city, right? So if I say, I went to seminary in St. Louis, you know, sort of tepid, but that's okay. The holy city. What is the holy city? The holy city really means the place you want to be. The beautiful city. The place that when you get there, you think, I want to stay there forever. Sort of like Irmo. But I want us to get this. There's a real city, but I want us to get the, the, the point of this text is that there's a spiritual Jerusalem. Right? It's not the city at, at 31 North, 35 East. There's a spiritual Jerusalem. The place of God, the place of the presence of God, the place that we walk into God's presence and enjoy who he is. That's what it means. Have you noticed in the bulletin, you know, for years now, I've, there's always the chapter of a day for the Bible reading. We have a three-year system for reading the Bible. I'm not smart enough to plan this out, but we're talking about Jerusalem right now. You know the Psalms we're in? If you read, we're in the, the Psalms in the 120s. We are in a bunch of Psalms that 15 of them in a row say a song of ascents, A-S-C-E-N-T-S. You know what that means? Uh, Psalm 119, longest psalm of the Bible. Some of you slugged through it, some of you skimmed. But beginning at Psalm 120 for the next 15, they're all songs of ascents. And those were psalms that people sang on the way up to Jerusalem. Read them with that in mind. I'm going to read a couple verses. Oh, that you were pilgrims would, would walk to Jerusalem and sing these psalms. Psalm 120, I call on the Lord in my distress and he answers me. That means that real life still goes on, but where are we going? We're going up. All right, let's catch it. We're going up, up to the holy city. Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills. You see what he's saying? I'm looking up to the mountain of God. Psalm 122, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. We're on our way to that place, right? Psalm 123, have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us, for we have endured much contempt. Believers in the world do get contempt, and so we come into the presence of God. Psalm 125, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken. I love Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. That's one of the songs of a sense. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand in vain. That's the life of the Christian to go up to what has God called us. Upward, the upward calling of God to think of heavenly things and to be headed toward him. You just sang this, by the way. The hymn of the day today was Jerusalem, my happy home. It doesn't mean the city in the Middle East. It means the spiritual Jerusalem. We're going to sing this, our first distribution hymn. I just want us to notice the words. It, during communion, you're going to be singing, we're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching where? Upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Where are we headed? We're headed to heaven. What direction are we going? Going up. We're going up. There is a criticism. I'll talk about this for a minute. The world criticizes Christians who think of heaven. They say that if a Christian spends their time thinking of heaven, they're talking about the pie in the sky. You've heard that phrase, right? They say you're being unrealistic. Christians who think about heaven aren't any good in the world. They've got their mind in the next world. They're no good in this. 
That's wrong. I, I wanted to address it. I always love what C.S. Lewis says. C.S. Lewis says, well, the, the question is, there, there either is or there is not a pie in the sky. <laughs> That's a fair question, right? And he says, and if there is, then it's a real topic. And he points out, I think correctly, Christians who think about the next world have done the best in this one. Did you know that? Christians who think about heaven have done the best in this world, and it's exactly the, uh, the opposite side of that coin, that churches that stop talking about heaven and the upward call of God stop making a difference here. Where are our eyes? Upward. Where do we live? Right here. What do we do? We live by faith right now. We make a difference. But where are we headed? Jerusalem, my home. Amen. And we stand together. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.